the periodic table is comprised of uh, mostly metals. Uh, there are also non-metals and metalloids. Metals have similar properties. We've looked at some of these physical properties. Uh, they're ductile, which means they can be bent or stretched. Uh, they're malleable, okay, which means that we can pound them. They're solid at room temperature, and they have high uh, boiling and melting points. Uh, when we look at nonmetals, there are only 17 uh, nonmetals in the periodic table. Their, their properties are opposite the metals, um, but they are either going to be uh, solid or gas at room temperature. And, um, but they have, uh, they're not malleable, they're not ductile. Uh, they have low boiling points, uh, low melting points. And then as far as metalloids are concerned, these are elements that share uh, properties that have some properties that are similar to metals and some properties that are similar uh, to non-metals. Here's a periodic table of elements. It's very similar to one that you'll find in your textbook. When you look at a periodic table, you'll see that it's organized in columns. These are called families. And it's also organized in rows, and these are called periods. There are a few of the families that we pay particularly close attention to in Science 10. The first one being alkali metals. Alkali metals uh, commonly form salts when they combine with halogens. And it's this entire column, but it is not hydrogen. Hydrogen is not an alkali metal. The next column that we look at is 2A, this one here. And these are the alkali earth metals. Over here, we go to the other side of the periodic table, and we have halogens. Halogens, again, like I said, most commonly uh, form compounds with the alkali metals. And then our other one that we're going to look at are the noble gases. And this does include helium. As far as the periodic table goes, I would never expect you to think that you have to memorize any of the information that's on here. You'll always be giving the periodic table whenever you have any kind of an evaluation. Um, just be familiar with what it is and where the elements are located. Uh, now as far as the, um, the metalloids are concerned, we talked about those before. They're found on this little staircase, okay? And you can see them here, okay? They're the ones that are in kind of this pink area, okay? So they're either here, they're called semi-metals, but they are metalloids, okay? And those are located here on this little staircase. And they have properties that are similar to both metals and non-metals. Metals are found primarily on the left side of the periodic table. Non-metals are found on the right side of the periodic table periodic table gives us information about each individual element. The first one is the atomic number. This is the number of protons that are found and I guess electrons as well. We're going to look at ions later on so electrons isn't necessarily true right now. We'll look at ions but you'll see that the number of protons is indicated by the atomic number and this number never ever changes for a specific element. That's basically its address, its placeholder on the periodic table. The next thing that we look at is of course there's a symbol for each element. It's going to be either an uppercase letter that's, sim that's by itself or if it's two letters it'll be an uppercase followed by a lowercase. The name will always be given as well. This number here on the other side you're going to see that it's going to be a positive or a negative. This one is a negative because nitrogen has an ionic charge of negative three. Okay. Uh, or nitride, I should say. Well, again, we'll talk about ions later. So this is the ionic charge is over here. Then we have two, uh, one number here, but it has two different meanings. First of all, there's the atomic mass number, and that's this number here, but we usually round it. And I'm going to look at uh, later on, this, this helps us calculate the number of neutrons that are in any given element, or sorry, in any given atom. And then we also have the atomic molar mass number. And that's actually what this number is. Uh, because you can't have 
a portion of a subatomic particle. And I'll get to that in a second. But the atomic molar mass number, this, is, uh, this has to do with isotopes. And we're going to look a little bit closer at isotopes later on. But this is all the information that you'll find for each individual element within the periodic table. Atomic theory, uh, we look at the subatomic particles. This is just a review. We've already talked about this in class. Electrons have a symbol of E with a little negative sign. Protons have a symbol with, of P with a positive sign. Neutrons we use uh, have a symbol with a small n. Electrons have a net charge of negative 1. So they have a charge of negative 1. Protons have a charge of positive 1. And neutrons have no charge. So that is why in an atom we have the number of protons, or sorry, the number of electrons and protons in an atom will be the same. We'll get to ions, it's going to be a little bit different. Now, of course, where are these found? These are found outside the atom, or sorry, outside the nucleus. These are found inside the nucleus, as well as these protons, or neutrons are also found inside the nucleus. The only other thing that we need to look at is how much, what is the mass of these? Well, right now, we're going to, though electrons do have mass, uh, we are going to say that they have, for our purposes, they have no mass. And protons have a mass of one mass unit. And neutrons also have a mass of one mass unit. Okay, we'll get to this a little bit later on. Of course, there is actually a number with this. Uh, but for now, we're just going to say that it's one mass unit for each. And the electron is so small that it has a negligible mass. So there are three subatomic particles, electrons, protons, and neutrons. And we need to have an understanding of how to calculate the number of neutrons. It's easy enough in an atom to figure out how many protons there are because it's always equal to the atomic number. It's easy enough to figure out how many electrons there are because that's also in an atom equal to the atomic number. But calculating neutrons is something just a little bit different. Now, if we look at, we're going to take a look at aluminum. Now, on your periodic table, aluminum has a atomic mass number of 26.9.98. Okay, that's its atomic mass number, and it has an atomic number of 13. So 13 is the number of protons. Is equal to 13. Okay, and we're not going to worry about electrons right now, but how do we calculate the number of neutrons? So there's a formula for this. Okay, the number of neutrons is equal to the atomic mass number and that we're going to round okay rounded and we're going to subtract the atomic number so in this case the number of neutrons is going to be equal to our atomic mass number rounded which is going to be 27 minus our atomic number, which is 13, okay? That's going to give us, sorry, that's going to give us 14. So that means that there are 14 neutrons. Very simple, okay? The number of neutrons is equal to the atomic mass number, rounded always, okay, to the nearest whole number, subtracting the atomic number. So the atomic number itself can actually change and we're going to look at that when we look at isotopes but calculating neutrons very simple you just have to remember to round that number because it's impossible to have a portion of a neutron we have to get rid of this decimal place we looked at the atomic models the other day in class and when we got up to Bohr's model of the atom he was the first person to say that electrons are organized in energy levels, okay? or shells is what he called them. 
and these are always organized in the same fashion. Okay, the first shell always contains two electrons. The second shell always contains eight electrons. The third shell also contains eight electrons and the fourth shell contains eight electrons. And we continue in that pattern. It's always two, eight, eight, eight. We're not gonna go beyond that in the periodic table in science 10. So understanding electron structure is very important. So if we look at, here's a carbon atom. Carbon has the atomic number of six, six protons. Here we have one, two, three, four, five, six electrons. Two of them exist in the first energy level, then we start to fill the second energy level. When we look over here at potassium, two in the first energy level, one, two, there are eight in the second energy level, two, four, six, eight. There are eight in the third energy level. And then the last one over here, because it has its atomic number is 19. That means that it has 19 electrons. This electron out here is known as a valence electron. A valence electron. These are also valence electrons. Valence electrons are electrons that are in the outermost energy level. They're very special. They're used when we uh, form ions, when atoms now form ions, which is what we're getting to. But you need to have an understanding, again, of the energy level. So it's always 2, 8, 8, 8. Always in that order, filling up until all the electrons are gone. Earlier I mentioned isotopes. Isotopes are different forms of a specific element. So for instance, I have carbon. Carbon has an atomic number of six. And it has a mass, I just need to look at my periodic table here, has a mass, atomic, atomic mass number in your textbook of 12.01. Now, where does this 0 0.01 come from? Because I've already established that we can't have a portion of a neutron, and we round this down. Well, an isotope, this number here, is the average mass of all known isotopes. of that given element. Very important. So what does that mean? <clears throat> well, we can have a number of varieties of carbon. We might see something known as carbon-12. Or it could form that has, and of course we would know that this would have six neutrons. Because with our calculations, we've done this before. 12 minus 6 gives us 6. Well, we can also have carbon. Again, the number of protons never changes because if we change the number of protons, then the actual element itself changes. But we can have something called carbon-13. Carbon-13 would have 7 neutrons. 13 minus 6 gives us 7. We could have carbon-14. So any time that we hear the, the, the number behind that, carbon-12, carbon-13, carbon-14, then we can consider it that that is the atomic mass number. The atomic number number changes, and carbon-14 would have 8 neutrons. Now for our purposes, you need to have an understanding of what isotopes are. We normally deal with carbon-12 because as I said earlier in our periodic table, the atomic mass number for carbon in our periodic table is 12.01. So we're always gonna round that. This is the most common form of carbon is carbon 12. That's basically what an isotope is. So an isotope is um, basically the the same element, because we haven't changed this, but it just has more neutrons or less neutrons in the nucleus. That's what an isotope is.